Exiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser and let me set the stage for you. This is what happened here this afternoon. We're in Seal Beach and we came down here to do a story on, of all things, the desalinization of water. And we finished doing the opening of the show down there on the beach, right here by the pier at Seal Beach. And we were walking back to the car and we saw something over on the side of the street that caught our attention. We stopped and started interviewing this guy. You'll see that in just a minute. And that, the moment that we stopped and started talking with him, started a whole chain of events where we ended up meeting some amazing people and talking with them and hearing their stories and here in just a matter of less than 30 minutes we have really I think tapped into the flavor and the energy of what Seal Beach is all about. This is a very special place. I think you'll be able to see that from the people we talk with and the stories that they tell. Look at that little bird. Does that little bird have a name? Uh, his name's Cuddles. Cuddles, what a great name for this bird. Here's the deal, we were walking down the pier here at Seal Beach and we ran into you, your name is? Kevin. We haven't really officially met, have we? We just no. got here and we saw you sitting here on the bench with this little bird and there's a wonderful story here. Tell us the story, what, what's the deal on Cuddles? Well, I, I got her about seven years ago. What kind of a bird is she? She's a peach-faced lovebird. A lovebird? Yeah, and they uh, mate for life, so I only got one, so it would, would bond to me. So she bonded with you right. instead of another bird. Right. And does she come out here with you and just sit on the glass behind you yeah, at the she, bench? She runs up and down here and talks to everybody. Uh, just has a ball out down here. This it's her favorite place. You're not worried about her flying away. No, she won't fly away. Yeah. She's, How do you she, know that? Well, she, it's been seven years. She she doesn't go very far away from me. And what is the noise she's making now? Is oh, she upset talking. that I'm here? No, not is at all. she? No. Is it all right if I sit yeah. down? Oh yeah. She might even jump over on your shoulder if, wow, uh, on her own, this. but it's got to be her idea. Wow. Yeah. And this has got to catch a lot of people's attention. Yeah, I talk about her a lot. <laughs> what kind of questions do people ask you? Mostly, uh, uh, you know, is she, is she, uh, will she fly away? And is it your bird? Yeah. You know, a lot of times they think it's a wild bird. Wow, this is an amazing thing. A love bird. So it's, it's not like I could put my hand out. No, it won't go to you. It'll just walk away. It won't bite you or anything. It'll just walk so away. So she really knows you. Right, this right. is like like a, any kind of a pet, this bird knows you right on. Right, right. She'll only go on my finger. And how long is she going to live? Uh, 15 to 20 years. So she's going to become, I guess she's already a huge part of your life. Oh yes, she is, yeah. Uh, it's no different than my lab from 20 years ago, really. Uh, they're social and they're just like dogs, really. And they want to be with you all the time. So uh, uh, instead of taking her for a walk, I put her on my shoulder. But uh, so, do you take her around oh, all yeah, day, every all, day, yeah, everywhere you go? Everywhere. Oh yeah, the bank and save on. Everybody you take loves her. her in the bank. Yeah, they love her. Yeah, everybody seems to love her. <laughs> this is amazing. I've, I've I've seen people with parrots on their shoulder that at the beach. Parrot. That that's a second smallest parrot is a lovebird. Wow. So it is a parrot. Where are they from? Where are they? Well, I think they're from South America, and somebody says Australia. Wow, they're just spectacular yeah. birds. Oh, yeah, she's. Do you? Where does she sleep at night? In a cage? Well, I'm trying does, to think a lovebird yeah, question. She, she actually, she actually does sleep and eat in a cage, but at night uh, she'll just crawl on my tank top and go to sleep right here. In uh, the bed. Know, yeah. No, I'll be in my recliner, and she'll just crawl in and go to right sleep. Right in, just yeah. sleep right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Until I go to bed, she'll just kind of hang there. So and do I'll, you all have a schedule, a daily? Uh, schedule? No, it's just. Uh, Whenever I'm around, whenever I go anywhere, I just take her. Did you ever think that you would get this attached? Although, I gotta tell you, just sitting here looking at cuddles, it's easy to see how you could get drawn in by this love Oh, bird. oh, they're great, they're really great. I saw uh, my wife get a, attached to a, a cockatiel, and they become best friends, and it, 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 it bonded to her. And when I saw that, two years later, I just got my own bird, because 
the cockatiel wouldn't even come near me. Really? Yeah, they they, they pick out who they want to be close to, and 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 she and she was home all the time, not working, and I was, so I wasn't there very often. So uh, that's how I knew to get to just get one. Was there was there a period when you all had to get to know each other and build up your confidence oh, no. and comfort level? No, not at all. I, I got it from a breeder at eight weeks old hand fed for eight weeks so it was used to being touched so it just crawled up my shirt and well, it just loved loved me right from so the beginning love at first right, sight. yeah and she just stuck right right with me boy she's a I vocal took her, little I, I thing took her out right away she's a vocal little thing isn't yeah she's she getting excited <laughs> now See, this is this is but but she's a mute when i go into save or the church or a church quiet. or anywhere you're not quiet. church. Uh, you yeah take her to church no i don't i, I meant i i meant uh the bank. bank. Yeah, and but but she won't say anything. But when she's out, she does. Wow. And why does she like it here? Cause there's traffic going by well, and people going by. She can hear by. things that we don't hear. I think she can hear the other birds and things, and she just loves it here. She can't wait to get here. Oh look! <laughs> you really want to see something? She watch came this. on your head. Yeah, watch this. She's like a track star. What are you gonna do? Oh, I just put her here, and she she just runs back. Uh, she like a little track star. <laughs> and she comes right to you. Oh yeah. When I get up to throw away the paper, she thinks I'm leaving, and she screams like whatever. Like I, in seven years, I've never walked, I've never really went away from her. But she she screams every time I go just ten feet away. Can you do that again? Can you get her yeah, down sure. there at the other end? <laughs> Where are you going? Where are you going? So oh, he's got to do a little track star you're excited, thing. Aren't you? Here she comes. Come on, cuddles. I think the camera may be intimidating her a little bit well, now. Well, she's never seen a camera. Well, I think when she sees things she's never seen before, that, that freaks her out a little bit. Here she comes. I think you ought to go down. No, no, she'll be all right. She'll no, come no, all she'll the be... way to you? Oh, yeah. Because we're kind of a... She might want to just stay there and run up and down. She here does she that comes. Too. She does that, and she really thinks she's the man up here. The six inches really makes a difference. Oh! And the other little sparrows come and sit here and, and she'll, you know, go toward them and they'll fly away because they're scared of her. You think it's because of the color? Her well, color? I know. I think it, it just she's, she's aggressive and they just don't understand the, the uh, you know, the sound. You know, uh, she, they've never heard it before. Now, is she getting ready to jump up on you? Oh, she might. It's, you know, she does. When she sees kids run toward her, she's a little people scare her. She'll, she'll, uh, she'll uh, uh, jump up on me then. To get away from them because they're unpredictable. I'm she's she's understood back. that. She, uh, yeah, she's I'm going to step back and see. That. Yeah, I bet she comes. Oh, look, look, look. Oh, see, people want it. The kids want to get to her, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to touch the bird? I don't think you. Oh. Well, you can do it this way. I got to hold it. Oh, look. Yeah. Can... <laughs> yeah I got I to gotta hold it, but she won't let it do it on its own. Come on, kids. You can come over and. Here you go. Oh my gosh. Oh wow. Can I touch it too? Sure. Oh wow. And she doesn't mind that at all. Wow. She puts up with it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I do it all the time because kids always want to talk. But. Oh, where is the bird now? It's, it's right on my shoulder. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, we could just stay here. I mean, there's so much going on here. You could make a whole afternoon. We could just stay here all day. Uh, she's, she's my whole social life, believe me. <laughs> she's my whole social life. <laughs> hey, Cuddles. Hey, Cuddles. Come on. From lovebirds... <laughs> to dogs, what's the deal on your two little dogs here? Uh, just a little chihuahua and a corgi. And look at them out here. Do they get along well together or are they... Absolutely, they play all the time. They love it. Why did you get this combination? Um, well, we had the corgi first and he's 10 years old and we just got the chihuahua recently. My, uh -huh. my, my daughter had a chihuahua and he fell in love with playing with her so we got one too. Got so what are we mate. doing just standing out here talking dogs? Uh, no we've been out on the pier watching uh -huh. the seagulls and the fish and the uh -huh. and people fishing. And what did fishing. you just see these little dogs come by and you wanted to 
We wanted to pet them. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, let's pet them. Come on. Can we pet the dog? Come on. Well, she probably loves being petted. Yeah, and what about the chihuahua? Uh, sometimes she's a little bit uh, afraid because she's just a, a puppy. Oh, she's a little, she's a little puppy. Look at that. I, Jake is just absolutely regal looking to me. Isn't he gorgeous? Oh, you've already got Jake's name. Oh, you already I've got know Jake's the name. name. Of the... Yeah, yeah. He's so my Jake favorite. is the big dog and the little dog is? Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> that, those are good names. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, it took us two months to, make, to name her. What? I said, thank you. It took us two, two months to name her. What? It was a big decision? Oh, yeah. My can we, can like we pick it. this little dog up? I want to get a good look at this little. And the name of this little dog is? Lucy. Lucy, look at this little dog. Aww. Howdy. Look at this little dog over here. Oh. She loves you. She Aww. loves everybody. <laughs> oh, she's a beautiful dog. Yeah, she's a sweetie. You know, I think Seal Beach has a nice, it's a nice feel around here. It's wonderful. I've been here two years and I wouldn't be anywhere else. We just talked to a guy across the street about his little lovebird that he has on his shoulder. And now we've got you with your two dogs, <laughs> Jake and Lucy. Yep. And there's lots of dogs in Seal Beach. Everybody's animal lovers here. Really? It's great. I mean, the dogs get fat because everybody's giving them treats. You go in the hardware store, they give them treats. You go anywhere, they give them treats. The mailman treats. <laughs> well, that's good. Let's get a good shot of Jake because we kind of neglected Jake. There he goes. Give us, yeah, give us your best side, Jake. There you go. Oh, boy. He is a regal looking dog, isn't he? Well, he's the queen's dog. The queen has corgis. Oh, I... Yeah. <laughs> How could I have forgotten that? There are dogs everywhere in I Seal know. Beach. He wanted to come see Your you. Your name Tay is? Jerry Chafin. This dog? is Tay Gray. Tay Gray. So yeah. this really is a dog town. Yeah, very much so. Everybody's out walking their dogs all the time so and doing their things. it's kind of a social thing Very here. much so. It's a great town. So how does your dog so stack up against the two? Did you see the two we were interviewing? No. No. What were they? There was a... The big dogs? The, what, what was that? Uh, the Queen's dog. What's that? A corky. Oh, a corky. And a chihuahua. Oh, so that, it's right in there. This is a what? <laughs> right in there. That's a Yorkie. I can't tell. Yeah. There's so much hair. <laughs> I know what to so, is the deal you just walk the dog? Well, you walk the dogs. You walk the dogs. I'm babysitting. Oh, uh, this isn't your dog. No, I'm babysitting. Whose dog is this? This is the Dunn's dog. This the is, Dunn's dog. Yeah, the Dunn's dog. Your neighbor's. Mm -hmm. So, I'm babysitting for the night so they could get away. <laughs> <laughs> they won't leave the dog by itself. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Well, this is fun. We're sure having a good time. Well, it's great to see you. We've so seen a love excited. bird and three dogs yeah. and met a lot of nice people on top of that. Keep around. It's great. We got twins here. What's the deal here? We got double trouble. Twins in Seal Beach. What's your name? It's in Austin. Wait a minute. What's your name? Dane and Austin. <laughs> they say everything the same. Oh, Dane and Austin. Oh, Dane and Austin. This right. is Dane and this, this is Austin. This is Dane and this is Austin. Boy, they are really, they're identical twins, aren't they? They sure are. Can you tell me how old you are? Tell me. We're three. three. We're three. <laughs> three We're here and three here, right? They answer, yeah. for, they answer the same for both people. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, can you say hi, Yulhauser? I do have to. <laughs> now, are you a local seal beachian? Yes, I am. And what, boy, you say that with such pride. Enthusiasm, yes. Now, it's that... the key to seal beach. Oh. <laughs> My gosh. So tell me, get me excited about seal beach. Well, seal beach is a place for fun and excitement. It's a small town with lots of uh, big, people. <laughs> big exciting events going on here. So four locals just pulled up. What's the deal here, fellas? Nothing, just hanging out, thinking about eating that taco surf right over here. Taco surf, that's Lovely. the local place in town? It's great, you gotta enjoy the tacos. Now listen, we just pulled into town and started meeting all these people. We got, we got people with, with pets, we got people with kids. This looks like a really friendly, nice place to live. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's really like a family-oriented community. And I've lived here my whole life, and it's a pretty good place to so grow up. So are you a beach guy? 
kind of. Are you a surfer? Or are you a... Uh... Not as much, but you could say that kind of. Yeah. So do you ever go into town? Do you ever go into L.A.? Or do you just... The beach people just stay here? Yeah. Stay here. Yeah, we town. stay. You just stay nice, here. Nice small town vibe. Really? It's nice. Yeah, I go to school in La Salle and uh, just hang out around here. So do you think you'll be able to afford to stay here when you... There's no way. <laughs> houses are so expensive. What? No, the apartments around here are so expensive, there's no way. Yeah. yeah. So what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Go to college, probably move up north. I'm not yeah. really sure yet. Haven't, haven't got to that stage yet. We got, we got two options. We can either split a house with six different guys, or we could live with our parents. Huh? <laughs> Till I'm 34. Remember that, Dad? It's a family affair. You all, look at all these fishermen coming up here. <laughs> come on, come on. If you all spent the... one more straggler coming up. Where have you been today? Right here on the pier? No, we just got here. Oh, so you're coming to fish. Yes, we are. So this is your fishing hangout. Yes, basically it is. What do you catch here? We catch mackerel, tomcuds. Single uh... men that are rich. Single <laughs> men that are rich. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is your family here. Don't be saying something like that. This is great. So this is a regular a regular thing that you yes, do we bring here. The there family. she There's, goes. Yes, we bring good. the family and we have a good time. Great. Well, you all have a wonderful day. Oh, I hope you catch will. something. Oh, we will. Now, Definitely. you don't go home empty-handed, do you? No. Yeah, <laughs> she's, yeah we have a competition fisherman. going you here. You are? Uh-huh. The very first thing I ever catch is a starfish. That tells you right there, I'm the star fisherman. <laughs> wow. Well, good luck. The we name never of this go family is the... Balderama The Balderama family. family. That's, the, how that's, do, it's Balderama. This is Edward, Lawrence, Cerise, Lawrence, Sarah Lynn, and Christina. Wow, that's a and a, you know what? A family that fishes together stays together. together. There you Have go. a great day on the Seal Beach Pier. Thank nice you so to much. meet you it's all. Pleasure to meet you. This is my son Ronnie. So this is just a uh, an afternoon thing to do. Just uh, actually, I've got my brothers out here. We're fishing. Um, the mackerel are going nuts out there. Mm -hmm. Guys are coming out of there with buckets of fish. Yeah, and you live in this town. Uh, actually, no, I don't. I Where came do here, live? I live in San Bernardino, and we don't have really good fishing spots, so we Whoa. come all the way out here to fish. How did you find Seal Beach? Why I used here? To, I used to live uh, just up the way here, not yeah. too far. Used to, so this has just always been a great little spot for me to come. And when you're out there in San Bernardino, you must be thinking of this place a oh, lot. I love this place. It's just the, 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 the people here are so nice. It's unbelievable. Well, you feel welcome no matter where you're at. Yeah. I mean, what are you doing, you know? Yeah, we've been great. made to feel welcome here all Have you been up day? and down the main street here? Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. You can't, I can't believe all the places. I mean, all the neat, neat little trinkets so people have. So this is literally main street. This, this is, is the main drag. This is it right here. This and is the main drag. And it straight main street, straight onto the pier. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is the best fishing spot in the whole county right here. This is it. Nice to meet you, nice sir. To meet your you, name sir. is? My name is Ron. Ron and Bickle. And your son's name? Ronnie Bickle the third. Can we shake hands? <laughs> I'm eating. You're what? Ronnie, I'm eating. Oh, Hauser. <laughs> say, say hi. Hey, come on. Let's on get his priorities straight. He's eating. He is. I'm telling you, that's more important. We've been out here fishing, so he's ready to go home and eat some fish. <laughs> now, do you all live here? No, we live in Whittier. So you've just, what, driven to the beach for the day to... Mm -hmm. Exactly. And how do you describe what this day has felt like to you? Because, boy, it sure feels good to me. Just relaxing. After a hard week, it's really relaxing just to come down here and spend some time together. Yeah. And did you know much about Seal Beach before you got here? Oh, actually, we've been coming here for quite some time now. Yeah, we've been coming here for about a number of years. To this specific place? To this specific place, yes. And what was it about this place that kept you coming back? Uh, well... For, for the most part, over here at Seal Beach in particular, um, it's not as crowded as most of the other beaches. Uh -huh. And so we can come here and re we can actually recuperate and relax. You know, Recuperate from what? Uh, from a hard week of work. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you all don't have any agenda at all here today except just no. to relax. Just uh -huh. to relax pretty much. You know, yeah. Take a nice walk on the pier and uh, lay out over here in the grass Yeah. That's for the most part. Well, have a wonderful day here. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Your name is? Chris. And? Ruth Ann. Enjoying the day here in Seal Beach. More kids here. Oh, yeah. How are this you? is a kid-friendly town, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. It's all you see, kids up and down. Well, all, all day I'm, and night. I'm, I'm impressed by the, the, the people we've met today. And this started off, we stopped because we saw a guy with a lovebird on his shoulder. And we started talking with him. And, and it's turned into this amazing 
place that we've just kind of captured the, there's a lot of energy, a good positive feel here. This is it, it's like this every day and night, not really? just on the weekends. Is that why people live here? Uh, that's why I live here and probably everybody else. Did you know that before you got here or was it just a pleasant surprise? No, I had no idea. You just fell into this. Got lucky. Wow, what a wonderful. But that's what makes it so hard to leave here too. Yeah. And that's great for kids like Seamus. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you. Nice Your to meet name you. is? Jay. And this is Seamus. Hi, Seamus. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet and here we go over here. You're just standing here with your USC That's right. Trojan shirt You know, Seamus is famous in this town. <laughs> I'm serious. Everybody no, come knows on. Seamus. Everybody knows Seamus. You're kidding. No, they're locals. They've been here forever. Well, Seamus his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so people really do know each other This is here. Mayberry by the Sea. It really That's is. That's what everybody it? calls it, Mayberry. Everybody knows their neighbors. Everybody's friendly. Everybody says hi to each other. It's a how great place. This, how did this place hey, escape the run. gentrification and the, the depersonalization of what's happening in so many places in Southern California? I would California. have to say because we're kind of hidden here. You know, we're off PCH. If you don't know about it, you don't even turn this way. You have Long Beach and Huntington Beach, and if you blink your eye, you passed us. So yeah. we're, we're kind of off, you know, we're off a little bit, but... It's a great place. I've been, I live here now. I've lived here about 11 years now, but I grew up in LA and my dad used to bring me fishing here on the pier almost every weekend. Me, my mom and dad, and my son and I grow up, I'm going to move out here. And here I am. A local just kind of standing here, taking all of this beauty and this feeling of, well, how do you describe what this feels like? It is just a great place to live. I've lived here since 1971. And I was born about two miles from here, so I've been around a long time. Why is it that Seal Beach has been off my radar all these years? Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> well, no, I, uh, Seal Beach is a very unique little town. Uh, it, uh, it's kind of uh, cut off from the, megal I can't pronounce the word, megalopolis yeah. uh, uh, around us. And we have a very... Uh, vibrant local political scene here a uh, lot of uh, people get involved and so it's it's a great place to live and they of course they care about the community they care about seal beach they really do and they must care about keeping the community the way it is and not not in introducing too much radical change here. That's certainly true and uh, in fact we have forestalled some huge developments right next to us uh, two times in fact and uh, you, uh, you probably are familiar there's a wetlands that's just behind Seal Beach here and we have managed to keep it a wetlands. It, it's not in very good shape right now but eventually it will be restored I hope. Yeah, yeah. so you've got your act together here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, a great place. The community must feel very good about that. Very good indeed. A third and fourth generation Seal Beachian here. Absolutely. You've been here that long. I have. My uh, dad moved here in 30, 39. Wow. Grandparents. So I've, I've lived my whole life here. So people tend to stay here. You kind of figure you, out early you, on this is a good place. You move, you move back. When I was in high school, it wasn't too fun. It was kind of like Mayberry, but uh, I, I moved back and I, I, I love it. Yeah, because there are worse things than to be like Mayberry. Uh, yeah. In fact, yeah. that's the second time we've heard this place <laughs> called Mayberry by the Sea today. It, it is, it is. Is nice that what quiet. the locals say? Uh, yeah. It's With nice affection. It, it, absolutely. It's a great place. It's a it's great a, place. It's a good place to raise your family. That's why I'm back. Let's Introduce us to your children here. Boy, aren't they beautiful children. Now, is this uh, the the average afternoon thing to do? Uh, Walk down the pier and oh, uh, we did it. Uh, this is the second time we're doing it. Uh huh. Yeah. Are you new to Seal Beach? No, no, we've been here for several years. And yeah. what do you have to say about this place? This is such a wonderful place. It's beautiful. We love coming here very often. Yeah. Oh, so you don't live here? We live in Seal Beach, yes. Oh, okay. So you just come down at night and walk down the pier and the That's kids like do. Yeah. to do that? And Today we just got a little bit of dinner and we're going to sit down here and eat some food oh, and so watch the sunset. Oh, so you're going to eat here at the, right on the pier? Oh, and you got the, the sunset, food yeah. right with you. <laughs> what are your children's names? You can ask them. Okay, I will. What is your name? Uh -huh. Nice to meet you, sir. And your name? Do you What's have it? a name? What is it? What is your sister's name? Mira. Mira. Oh, that's a, and how old is your sister? Two. 
Wow. Beautiful I, children. And my brother and Walter is, and my and Walter is two. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You have beautiful children. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner together. Bye-bye. Bye. Wave Thank goodbye you. to the camera. Can you wave goodbye to us? Wave goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> So that's it. We came to Seal Beach. We were doing a story down here on desalting of water. Yeah. And we ended up meeting a lot of nice people. We saw a guy with a love bird. We met some people with dogs, right. babies, fishing poles. Yeah. What a place. It is a nice place. We enjoy it. All's right with the world. Yeah. You never know where you're going to find your stories. And we have had a wonderful time. Let's look down the pier, because that's where we started, right here in Seal Beach. We're surrounded with wonderful stories and great people everywhere we go here in Southern California. Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.
Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser, and here we are standing in one of the most historic spots in the entire city of Los Angeles. We're in this beautiful courtyard of the Avila Adobe, which has the distinction of being the oldest dwelling still standing in the city of Los Angeles. It was built in 1818. It's located here on Olvera Street. Olvera Street is just right there, and this little courtyard is a real jewel. Now, we have come to the adobe to do a story about something that was critical to the development of Los Angeles, and of course, it's still critical today. We're talking about water and there is a wonderful water story here, right here on Olvera Street. And to get that water story, we're going to go to the Water Museum, which is located right here in the corner of the courtyard of the Avila Adobe. And here it is, Exhibitions, the History of Water in Los Angeles. We're going into this little water museum. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves. This is, well, I know this is Bill Estrada, and your title, Bill? Uh, I'm a curator and historian for El Pueblo de Los Angeles Historical Monument, uh, which houses world famous Olvera Street. So All right, so it's not, it used to be a state historic park. Now it's a city park? Right, the city of Los Angeles uh, is in charge of the entire 44-acre landmark, so um, all of us are city employees. Olvera Street has 44 acres? Uh, no, the entire monument uh, has 44 acres, and Olvera Street is one of our features, probably our most famous feature of El Pueblo Monument. Okay, we got that straight. And this is Sam Luna, and you are the general manager General Manager of El Pueblo Historical Monument, yes. Okay, now you gentlemen know why we're here in this wonderful little water museum here that's kind of tucked away. This little museum itself is kind of a gem here uh, in the park. Bill, as the curator and the historian, tell us a little bit about the history of water in L.A. And we have some pictures here, starting with this one, which shows what? Uh, this one shows a woman gathering, uh, uh, collecting water in the traditional way uh, from the Los Angeles River. She's placing it into a, um, a clay pot or olla to carry it in, uh, to her home. And that really is the story of, of water in Los Angeles in terms of uh, people uh, acquiring water for, for domestic purposes and for irrigating their farms. And in, in this room on, on two levels, is the story of water beginning with the early Zanha system or ditch system that begins our town and leading all the way to the acquisition of water from the Owens Valley in 1913. Okay, right over here, Louis, this is the picture of the famous aqueduct here, uh, the Mulholland Aqueduct that brought water down from the Owens Valley into LA. But we're starting with this because this is the traditional way that for the first couple of decades of the city of Los Angeles, people got their water in little jars like this from the L.A. River, which is hard for us to believe today when we think of the L.A. River, but people used to drink the water right out of the river. That's because the L.A. River was the, the, the source of water for the city of L.A., the local source of water. Uh, this system, this Zanha system, uh, was established immediately, just seven weeks after the city was founded in 1781. So the city was founded in September of 1781. By the end of October, the residents of, of the tiny Pueblo of Los Angeles uh, knew in order to survive, they had to have a water system. So the Zanha system, this open ditch system, which tapped into the Los Angeles River and brought water to the farms and to the people, to their homes, was essential. All right, now here is a drawing. This is a drawing of the ditch being dug that would bring the water from the L.A. River into the city. And this was just a ditch uh, dug out of dirt. Right, the, di the, the ditch was dug out of dirt and it's been tended by a zanjero or water master or water overseer. And uh, the ditch was also reinforced with rock and clay 
uh, on its sides and even on the bottom. Uh, uh, arroyo rock, rocks were placed at the bottom of the Zanha in order to reinforce it to protect it from, from storms. And okay, so the ditch, kind of the open ditch, lasted for a while, and then we very quickly moved. Sam, what is this right here? Well, that actually happens to be a picture of a, 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 the tree that, that came later on that began to be come into use where this actually ended up becoming almost a petrified uh, substance inside the tree and wood on the outside. This came later. One thing that happened was the, uh, the building of the clay bricks that covered the zanha, or the ditch, and uh, as the system grew to almost 93 miles throughout the LA Basin. Okay, so this was like a wooden water pipe. These are wooden water pipes, but I have to correct something. that They, they do connect into the zanha system. The zanha system uh, for Los Angeles was in, was in use from 1781 when the city was founded, and w we have the system in use all the way up until about 1904. The and original system. The original system. So Los Angeles was still dependent on local water for, um, for that length of time. All right, now here, now we're getting to the picture of the, Z what was it called again? The Zanja. Zanja, Z-A-N-J-A. -A. Which means? Which means ditch and what we have here at Overa Street is the Zanja Madre, Madre, which is the mother ditch which connects directly into the LA River. So we're very fortunate and very proud to have the mother ditch that uh, provided water for the entire Pueblo of Los Angeles. Okay, I'm just looking up here. What is this up here? Is this one of those wooden? Yes, this is one of the wooden pipes. That is that one of the originals or a replica? It, no, it, it's, it's a replica of the wooden pipes that, that were part of this water system as it was evolving. In the 1860s, we have this evolution from the Zanha system and then, and then improving the system, tapping into the system with wooden pipes, gradually leading to iron pipes by the 1870s and 1880s. Ah. So we still have the Zanha as, as being central to this water system. We still haven't uh, acquired our water from the Owens Valley yet. So, so the Zanha system was really an important part of a valley in its early development. And this picture is one of my favorites because it shows the actual LA's first reservoir, and we have so many reservoirs today, but this was it, and it was located right here on Olvera Street. Yes, this is a uh, reservoir or brick holding tank. It was constructed uh, around 1860, and it's located presently where our kiosco or bandstand, where anyone can come on a given day and hear music. Well, right in the center of our plaza, this uh, brick re uh, reservoir was, was located, and it lasted until about the late 1860s, about 1870, and then it was... So for over five or six decades, this was our only reservoir. Correct. Wow, that's hard to believe when you think of all the water we consume today. Right. Um, yeah, it's extremely interesting that in the middle of the city's plaza where, the, where the, the, the townsfolk would gather centrally, that that's where they placed their, their reservoir for all of their water. But that just tells you the importance that water played in the development of the city. Absolutely. And I mean, there would have been no, probably Los Angeles, if the Los Angeles River hadn't been here for, for us to settle on and build on. All, all of your major cities, if you look on the world map, you'll see that they're all founded near a major river, a major water source. Okay, now the Mother Ditch was first built in... The Mother Ditch was connected in 1781. Uh, it was, wow, again, improved, old? it was developed over time. Uh, in a while, we're going to see um, kind of a brick arch over, over the mother ditch. It was covered, it was gradually covered with brick in order to prevent uh, further damage from storms, in order to uh, decrease the evaporation of water, and thirdly, a big problem that we even still deal with today is pollution. In order to cut down the pollution that was happening in the Zanha system, uh, it was by the 1880s covered over with, with brick, and we're going to see that in just a little while. Yeah, well, well we're going to see that right now okay. because yeah. right downstairs, as part of this little water museum, is a section of that original mother ditch. Correct. Let's go down and see it right now. Okay, continuing our tour, we've come down to the lower level to see, look at this, Louie, this is a real piece of LA history. What are we looking at, Bill? We are looking at about an 11-foot section of the original Zanja Madre, 
and it's covered with, with brick, uh, like I mentioned before. This covering occurred around the 18, uh, 1880s, but this is the original Zanja, Zanja Madre, which, which interesting about this is that it hasn't moved. We didn't place it here. It, it never moved. After the 1971 Silmar earthquake, uh, the building that we're in is a new addition to the Avila Adobe, because we wanted to put some offices in our park. So during the excavation, you found this. The workers found this during the excavation, and a piece of LA's past just came up to wow. say hello to us. And look at this. This is the map over here. Sam, what is this map we're seeing? This is fascinating. This map shows um, actually the, the blue lines there. The, that's the first blue line of Los Angeles. <laughs> um, it actually shows the system of arteries feeding into the, the Zanja Madre, the Zanja Madre being the ditch that feeds directly into the LA River as the primary source. And this is the system underneath the city of these ditches, this Zanja system, that uh, takes water to the public, uh, uh, to the town. So these ditches, this ditch, this mother ditch, spread out all over all Los over, Angeles. How over, many miles was it again? About 93 miles. Wow, and how much of that 93 miles of ditch system do you think is still hidden somewhere underneath our city today? A significant portion, Hugh. Just like and, this one. And, and uh, um, we all know from our headlines that uh, just last year, uh, a section of it was found in uh, just not too far from, from Overa Street. Mm -hmm. So it's down there. Uh, people are probably, developers are probably running across it and wondering what in the world it is when they, when think, they dig it up. Right, and I think for, for years, since it's been years as the city's grown, developers have noticed it and uh, developed because it, you know, it, it hasn't been um, maybe respected as much as it could have been respected. But for the pieces that we found here and what we've done is uh, for a whole building to be constructed around this type of find, uh, it'd be great if we had that sort of uh, uh, consciousness in the city of, for our history and the way it was. Developed. Well, you've certainly shown it the proper respect here. And looking in here at this little water wheel up here, that's part of the history too, because that water wheel helped bring water to Los Angeles, didn't it, Bill? Right. Um, as the Zanja system, as water distribution evolved in Los Angeles, people in Los Angeles developed ways to bring water directly out of the LA River, and this dates back to the late 1850s, and that water would eventually connect into the Zanja water system. And we have photographs, uh, we have many photographs of the various water wheels that existed in LA, uh, a few very close to Dodger Stadium, the present-day Dodger Stadium, but we do not have any uh, living remnants. We don't have any section. Yeah, well, the wood anymore. wouldn't have survived, whereas Correct. the brick ditches would have. Correct. You also uh, said that we wanted to go back and talk a little bit more about this fellow right here who was called a... Zanjero. And, and, and this was a very important uh, person in the city of Los Angeles because without the Zanjero, this water system would not have worked, and without a water system, we have no city. So the Zanjero was, uh, what it basically means from the Spanish to the English, is water master or water overseer. And the Zanjero was so important as the person who did the following. He uh, conducted maintenance on the Zanja system. He issued permits for the use of water because you had to pay for your permit. Oh my gosh. And, uh, and, and that ranged uh, from, during the 1870s, it cost about $1.50 to uh, tap into the system. Which for, was a lot of money back then. For irrigating your, your, your farm. And it was based on length of time, uh, not volume of water. The way we pay our bills today is based on volume. But in the 1870s, you would pay the Zanjero $1.50 to irrigate your farm for, let's say, 10 to 12 hours at night. Wow. The Zanjero was such an important figure, Hugh, that in the 1870s, he was the highest paid city official. He made more money than the mayor, sheriff, and all city council members. That's how important water was to the city. We have a, a, uh, an ad for uh, upstairs. Yes, there's an ad uh, for some deputy Zanjero positions that were open at the time, I think back in the 1870s. And we have it up on the wall. You might get a shot of it later. But Zanjero, the, the official translation is from Spanish is superintendent of a water department, which is Boy. what they really were. They were precursors for that. He really was powerful. How did they choose this guy? Uh, was it politics? Uh, I'm sure, well, there's always <laughs> politics, but I, I'm sure he was someone who had the skill and the ability because there was a lot of skill involved in terms of maintaining the system, 
issuing permits. So you had to be a politician, you had to be a little bit of a sheriff. Technician. And, and you had to be, a, engineer. A, 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 yeah. be an engineer. So you had to be a very, very skilled individual. And then you also had to, uh, like I said, enforcement. You had to enforce these policies whenever the law was broken. So you had to do a lot of things and have support of the people. Well, this has been very interesting. This little museum that is filled, there are all kind of pictures here that really trace the history of water in LA from the very beginning all the way up to the Owens Aqueduct. Right. Uh, and, and of course, the, the centerpiece of the whole museum is this wonderful bit of history here. Uh, you can come here to see a piece of the mother ditch but what's exciting, and we kind of referred to it a minute ago, is that there's still, you know, probably 70 or 80 miles of this ditch hidden underneath LA. And from time to time, people come across other segments of it. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to go in search of another section of the mother ditch. Okay, as the adventure continues, we have now come. We're right off the 900 block of North Broadway, and we have come down to a, well, it doesn't look very historic here, does it? No, this is an old yard, uh, an old uh, yard for the, the trains. And, um, and there's the LA, there's a bridge that goes over the LA River way down there. So we've come to the vicinity of the LA River. That's right, and we're coming to the portion of the mother ditch that was found recently. Yeah, that's why we're here to do a little archaeological work down at the bottom of the hill here. We're in search of another part of the original mother ditch. Now, Bill, this is really a very interesting part of LA. It's called the cornfields. It's still called that today, and it's called that for a reason because it once was a cornfield. This was a vast agricultural area of Los Angeles, and the LA River is just right alongside back here. So it was uh, a prime space for agricultural development, and we still refer to it as the cornfields so today. So they literally grew corn all down through here? And, and other crops, and later on transferred over to being used as a railroad yard. So that's why you see a lot of remnants of the old railroad. You have a railroad line running right here about 20 feet from us. But originally it was a cornfield and, right. and other things, and it was supplied with water probably by the mother ditch. Correct. Which ties in to why we're down here in the cornfields, because look over here. Look what we have found. Good morning. Good morning. How you all doing? Introduce yourselves to everybody. I'm Melody Carver with the Los Angeles History Slugs. The what? The Los Angeles History Slugs. Slugs? Uh -huh. Where, how did you get that name? Well, because uh, sometimes um, when you're doing research, it can be kind of sluggish and oh. slow. So we were trying to come up with a tricky name. <laughs> that was a good one, all right. And is this your partner in crime? Yes, it yeah. is. Uh, Craig Howell, uh, Los Angeles History Slugs. <laughs> and manager of the Public Utilities History Center of Los Angeles. Okay, that's a big title. Big title, and big title. Basically, big title. what you all did, you were nosing around down here, and look what they found down here. Part of the original mother ditch. Part of the original mother, mother ditch, yes. Yes, considerably different than the one down at uh, the plaza. I mean, look at the condition of the bricks. What do you mean? The well, look how, how ragged everything is in here versus the rather nice brickwork that was done where the people could really see it. And look, it looks like two levels. It's two, it's two levels, and this one is completely round. It's 36 inches in diameter inside, and these uh, walls average out around seven inches thick. Do you think that maybe the first original ditch was this first layer down here, and then th this was added on we're, later? We're not really 100% sure where it ran, considering that it was an open ditch, and that when this one was being built, the other one had to keep running, because they had to keep getting irrigation and commercial water for the city. So this would have had to been built concurrent with the other one flowing, and at some point, they would then reroute the water into this section and do the same thing in another. How old do you think this is? This probably dates from the mid-1870s. Uh, wow. And when you all found it down here, how did you find it? Was it covered and you all it just... Was, it was pretty much covered, it, except for about this much of it. It was, it was all dirt up in here. And I was walking along, and we just had a rain, 
and the light was shining through the clouds and uh, I happened to notice that there was a layer of brick and you can see other portions of brick around here but this one was casting a shadow of a round object not a flat wow. surface did you know what you had found I figured I had knew what it was because uh, hydraulically from the water tunnel which sets under the uh, Broadway bridge up here it had to follow along here so as soon as I saw this I got a stick started poking there was a round hole I knew what we had were the two of you together when it happened uh, no we weren't but we've been looking for this for five years we've been walking up and down the bluff here and we've even run into the rail police and had conversations with them <laughs> the rail police yeah. wanted what are you and, doing uh, around here anyway um, we, we, Craig came uh, home and called me and says I think I found the Zan Hamadre and so we came back uh, the next day and uncovered more of it took pictures of it and then uh, I said we have to make a list you know of people you know to, like we the first person on our list was the plaza so and you call them yeah we called them we gave them the photos that we uh, took hope they'll put it in their water display and then uh, we gave photos to Catherine Mulholland in memory of her grandfather. We're giving photos to the LA Library and to the State Library and to the Bancroft Library. And we're doing this story, right. which kind of documents this. And look over here, I'm just looking over your shoulder. Look at this thing. Did you is this just sitting here? No. no Baker no. Ironworks. That's part, of the public, that's part of the Public Utilities History Center collection. Oh, so you place this here we for us. Today. That, okay, the reason it's there is that right above us up in here was the Baker Ironworks. Ah. And they, they, from what we understand of the records, they drew water for their commercial purposes out of the Zanha, plus the capital milling down here used water from this channel to power their grist mill. So you've tied all this together in a neat little package yeah. for the us. Down there is the uh, domestic service. This is the commercial, industrial. And in the later days, in the very last stages of the use of the Zanha system in 1904, there was very little irrigation left. Most of it was commercial, including the trolley system they used it for their boiler and condensing water. Boy, this is all interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And it it's really just kind of hidden away. Yeah. But thanks to the LA history slugs, mm -hmm. you all have uncovered. Come on, gentlemen, come over here because we all kind of want to stand here together. <laughs> this is fascinating stuff, isn't it? It is fascinating, and we're very lucky to have uh, uh, people like History Slugs, the who, slug. who uh, really are passionate about our history and go out and find it. Okay, just when you thought the adventure was over, it continues because we have come from right over across the cornfield on North Broadway. Now we're over on North Spring Street. Our entourage keeps getting bigger. We now have with us Tom Buckley, who is Mr. Railroad here in Los Angeles. We're old friends from Union Station days. And Mike Fertney, who is with Union Pacific, who owns a lot of the cornfield today, right, Mike? The railroad does, yes, that's correct. Absolutely. And Tom, in conversation with me the other day, totally unrelated to the story we just did on the Mother Ditch, mentioned to me about a plaque down here on the cornfield Tom, let's go over and take a look at the plaque. Fine. Because this is a very obscure part of Los Angeles railroad history. Well, yes, but a very important part. Obscure now, but at one time, this was one of the busiest parts of railroad operations in Los Angeles. Tell us what was right here commemorated by this plaque. And everybody, come on over here. Let's stand behind the plaque as Tom kind of fills us in on the history of this place. Uh, this plaque marks where River Station was, and that was really the first main railroad station in Los Angeles um, back in the uh, well, 1880s. Well, now it says here, September the 5th, 1876, the first train arrived right here. Correct. That, that was train coming down from San Francisco through the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, if River Station was here then, I don't, I don't recall. <laughs> but uh, there was a station actually before River Station um, down the road a piece toward where Union Station is now. But River Station is kind of identified as the first station in Los Angeles. And since then, there have been four other stations. Yeah. 
Uh, we all think of Union Station, but that was just the latest built in the 1930s. Uh, completed in 19, opened in 1939. And before Union Station, there was the Central Station, and that was down at Fifth and Central, and that was from about 1912 or so up to 1939. And prior to that, there was the Arcade Station, uh, and that was from 1888 to about 1912. Boy, this is so obscure, and when we were looking for pictures of the old River Station, we could find one photograph in existence of River Station. Uh, yes, it's in this book, but this isn't a very good copy. Uh, it was a very important you know, place in Los Angeles, and there was actually a little hotel that was right here in the vicinity, too. But uh, River Station has that significance, and the uh, historic experts will tell you there was something before River Station, but it was really uh, the important station in that era. Well, now, I'm sure our history slugs, you've heard of this, haven't you? Oh, yes, River yes, River Station? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, the station actually uh, was uh, a hotel and station combined. It had a dining room, pantries, uh, sleeping rooms. That was more of a bunkhouse when they talk about a hotel. This was a facility mainly for the uh, railroad workers. This is where the engine shops were located, the car shops were located. So it's more of a sleeping bunkhouse than it was anything else. Boy, he knows his history. Yes, there's experts around all the time. So. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, this is nothing. All you have to do is uh, you go through some of the maps and everything, and they have floor plans of the building. And you just pretty much learn it off the, off the floor plan. Well, now, have you dug around in here? Do you think there might be any river station kind of underground like the Mother Ditch was? It might be out there. So it, it, was it might be right out, in this area, yeah, right uh, in here. It was down slightly from where we are, but we're basically just about where the sleeping rooms would have been located. Wow. It was a rather long building. Let's all go over here, right here, and just stand with this as the background, because what we've ended up finding out today, come on, everybody, the slugs are breaking up the rear over here. Uh, what we have found out today, both by our discussions about the mother ditch and now by the finding of this little obscure plaque here that this area this part of los angeles was absolutely the center of everything in our early early history of this city yeah and that's why we refer to el pueblo the overa street area as the birthplace of los angeles because it truly is yeah it all happened right here water railroads agriculture residential business it was all right here in the cornfields, and as we said earlier, all you have to do is scratch just a little bit beneath the surface, and you'll find all of this rich history right here. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the slugs. You know, we're going to hook up with you all later on and do a whole other program where you can take us around and show us some more hidden parts of L.A. Oh, great. Yeah. I think we've got That's some more, don't we? That's super. We yeah, more. we sure do. You got some more for we, us? We got a whole bunch for you. He's teasing us now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Bill. We haven't met this guy yet. Are you part of this, or are you just walked out? just a general manager. Oh, okay. Good. All right. It's been our day uncovering a little bit of L.A.'s history. Visiting with Huell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.